Section three The Mine of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A mine was successfully exploded under a section of the enemy's trench. Actual extract from an official dispatch. Work on the saphead had been commenced on what the captain of the sappers called a beautiful night, and what anyone else outside a lunatic asylum would have described with the strongest adjectives available in exactly the opposite sense. A piercing wind was blowing in gusts of driving sleet and rain. It was pitch dark, black as the inside of a cow, as the corporal put it, and it was bitterly cold. But since all these conditions are exactly those most calculated to make difficult the work of an enemy's sentries and lookouts, and the first work of sinking a shaft is one which it is highly desirable should be unobserved by an enemy, the sapper's captain's satisfaction may be understood. The saphead was situated amongst the ruins of a cottage a few yards behind the forward firing trench, and by the time a wet daylight had dawned, the sappers had dung themselves well underground, and securely planked up the walls of the shaft, and had cut a connecting gallery from the ruins to the communication trench. All this meant that their work was fairly free from observation, and the workers reasonably safe from bombs and bullets, so that the officer in charge had good cause for the satisfaction with which he made his first report. His first part of the work had been a matter of plans and maps, of compass and level, of observing the ground, incidentally dodging the bullets of the German snipers who caught glimpses of his crawling form by day, and of intricate and exact figuring and calculating by night, in the grimy cellar of another ruined house by the light of a candle, stuck in an empty bottle. Thereafter he spent all his waking hours, and many of his sleeping ones as well, in a thick suit of clay mud. He lived like a mole in his mine gallery, or his underground cellar, saw the light only when he emerged to pass from his work to his sleep or meals, and back to his work, and generally gave himself, his whole body and brain and being, to the correct driving of a shallow burrow, straight to the selected point under the enemy trench, a hundred and odd yards away. He was a youngish man, and this was the first job of any importance that had been wholly and solely entrusted to him. It was not only his anxiety to make a creditable showing, but he was keen on the work for the work's own sake, and he reveled in the creative sense of the true artist. The mine was his. He had first suggested it, he had surveyed it, and plotted it, and measured and planned and worked it out on paper, and now when it came to the actual pick-and-shovel work, he supervised and directed and watched each hour of work and each yard of progress. It was tricky work, too, and troublesome. At first the ground was good stiff clay, that the spades bit out in clean mouthfuls, and, and that left a fair firm wall behind. But that streak ran out in the second day's working, and the mine burrowed into some horrible, soft, crumbly soil that had to be held up and back by roof and wall of planking. The subaltern took a party himself and looted the wrecks of houses. There was no lack of these in the village just behind the lines, of roof beams and flooring, and measured and marked them for sawing into lengths, and would have taken a saw with pleasure himself. Then he dived cheerfully into the oozing wet burrow and superintended the shoring up, and restarted the men to digging, and emerged a moment to see more planking passed down. He came, in fact, dangerously near to making a nuisance of himself, and some of his men who had been sapping and mining for wet and weary months past were inclined to resent quite so much fussing round and superintendence. But the corporal got it right. He was an elderly man with a nasty turn of temper that had got him into almost as many troubles in his service as his knowledge, experience, and aptitude for hard work and responsibility had got him out of. "'Leave the lot be,' he had said when some of the party had passed grumbling remarks about too bloomin' much fuss and feathers over a straight, simple, bloomin' job. The corporal had promptly squashed that opinion. "'Leave the lad be,' he said. "'He's young for the job, maybe, but he's not such a simple fool as some that take this for a simple job. It's not going to be all that simple, as you'll find out before you're done.' 
He was right, too. The crumbling soil was one little difficulty promptly and easily met. The next was more troublesome. The soil grew wetter and more wet until at last the men were working ankle-deep in water. The further the mine went, the wetter it became. The men worked on, taking their turn at the narrow face, shoveling out the wet muck and dragging it back to the shaft and up and out and away by the communication trench. They squeezed aside in silence when the subaltern pushed in to inspect the working, and waited with side winks to one another to see what he would do to overcome the water difficulty. Pumps would, of course, have been the simple answer. But the men knew as well as the subaltern knew that pumps were not to be had at that particular time and place for love or money, and that all the filling of all the indents in the R.E. would not produce one single efficient pump from store. The subaltern did not trouble with indent forms or stores. He had had something of a fight to get a grudging permission for his mine, and he felt it in his bones that if he worried the big chiefs too much with requisitions, he would be told to abandon the mine. He shut his teeth tight at the thought. It was his mine, and he was going to see it through, if he had to bail the water out with a teacup. He made a quick cast through the shell-wrecked village, drew blank, sat for fifteen minutes on the curb of a rubble-choked well, and thought hard, jumped up and called the corporal to provide him with four men and some odd tools, and struck back across muddy and shell-cratered fields to the nearest farm. The farmer, who had remained in possession despite the daily proximity of bursting shells, a shrapnel-smashed tile roof, and a gaping hole where one house corner should have been, made some objection to the commandeering of his old-fashioned farm pump. He was at first supported in this by the officer in charge of the men billeted in the barn and sheds, but the sapper explained the urgency of his need, and cunningly clinched the argument by reminding the infantry officer that probably he and his men would soon be installed in the trenches from which the mine ran, and that he, the sapper, although he was not supposed to mention it, might just hint that his mine was only hurrying to forestall an enemy mine which was judged to be approaching the trench the infantry officer would presently occupy. This last was a sheer invention of the moment, but it served excellently, and the sapper and his party bore off their pump in triumph. It was later erected in the mine shaft, and the difficulty of providing sufficient piping to run from the pump to the waterlogged part of the mine was met by a midnight visit to the house where headquarters abode, and the wholesale removal of gutters and rain pipes. As headquarters had its principal residence in a commodious and cobwebby cellar, the absence of the gutters fortunately passed without remark, and the sentry who watched the looting and the sergeant to whom he reported it were quite satisfied by the presence of an engineering officer and his calm assurance that it was all right, orders, an engineer's job. The pump did its work excellently, and a steady stream of muddy water gushed from its nozzle and flowed down the headquarters gutter pipes to a selected spot well behind the trenches. Unfortunately, the pump, being old-fashioned, was somewhat noisy, and all the packing and oiling and tinkering failed to silence its clank-clink, clank-clink, as its arm rose and fell. The nearest German trench caught the clank-clink, and by a simple process of deduction and elimination, arrived at its meaning and its location. The pump and the pumpers led a troubled life after that. Snipers kept an unsteady but never silent series of bullets smacking into the stones of the ruin, whistling over the communication trench and whopping into the mud around both. A light gun took a hand and plumped a number of rounds each day into the crumbling walls and rubbish heaps of stone and brick and burst shrapnel all over the lot. The sappers dodged the snipers by keeping tight and close to cover. They frustrated the direct-hitting fizz-bang shells by a stout barricade of many thicknesses of sandbags bolstering up the fragment of wall that hid their shaft and pump, and finally they erected a low roof over the works and sandbagged that secure against the shrapnel. There were casualties, of course, 
but these are always in the way of business with the sappers and came as a matter of course the germans brought up a trench mortar next and flung noisy and nerve-wracking high explosive bombs into and all around the ruin bursting down all the remaining walls except the sandbagged one and scoring a few more casualties until the forward trench installed a trench mortar of their own and by a generous return of two bombs to the enemy's one put the german out of action a big Minnenwerfer came into play next, and because it could throw a murderous-sized bomb from far behind the German trench, it was too much for the British trench mortar to tackle. This brought the gunners into the game, and the harassed infantry, who were coming to look on the sapper subaltern and his works as an unmitigated nuisance, and a most undesirable acquaintance who drew more than a fair share of enemy fire on them, appealed to the guns to rid them of their latest tormentor. An artillery observing officer spent a perilous hour or two amongst the shrapnel and sniper's bullets on top of the sandbagged wall until he had located the Minnenwerfer. Then about two minutes telephone talk to the battery and ten minutes of spouting lidite volcanoes finished the Minnenwerfer trouble. But all this uh, above-ground work was by way of an aside to the sapper subaltern he was far too busy with his mine gallery to worry about the doings of gunners and bomb throwers and infantry and such like fellows. When these people interfered with his work, they were a nuisance, of course, but he always managed to find a working party for the sandbagging protective work without stopping the job underground. So the gallery crept steadily on. They had to carry the tunnel rather close to the surface, because at very little depth they struck more water than any pumps, much less their single farmyard one, could cope with. The nearness uh, to the surface made a fresh difficulty, and necessitated the greatest care in working under the ground, beneath the trenches, because there were always deep shell-holes and craters to be avoided or floored with the planking that made the tunnel roof. So the gallery had to be driven carefully at a level below the danger of exposure through a shell hole and above the depth at which the water lay. This meant a tunnel too low to stand or even kneel in with a straight back, and the men, kneeling in mud, crouched back on their heels and with rounded back and shoulders, struck their spades forward into the face and dragged the earth out spadeful by spadeful. And despite the numbing cold mud they knelt in, the men, stripped to shirts with rolled sleeves and open throats, streamed rivulets of sweat as they worked, for the air was close and thick and heavy, and the exertion in the cramped space was one long muscle-racking strain. Once the roof and walls caved in, and three men were imprisoned. The collapse came during the night, fortunately, and still more fortunately behind the line and parapet of the forward trench. The subaltern flung himself and his men on the muddy wreckage in frantic haste to clear an opening and admit air to the imprisoned men. It took time, a heart-breaking length of time, and it was with a horrible dread in his heart that the subaltern at last pushed into the uncovered opening and crawled along the tunnel, flashing his electric torch before him. Halfway to the end, he felt a draught of cold air, and promptly extinguishing his lamp, saw a hole in the roof. His men were alive, all right, and not only alive, but keeping on hard at work at the end of the tunnel. When the collapse came, they had gone back to where their roof lay across the bottom of a shell hole, pulled a plank out, and gone back to work. When the tunnel reached a point under the German parapet, it was turned sharp to left and right, forming a capital T, with the cross-piece running roughly along the line of trench and parapet. Here there was need of the utmost deliberation and caution. A pick could not be used, and even a spade had to be handled gently, in case the sounds of working should reach the Germans overhead. In some places the subaltern could actually hear the movements and footsteps of the enemy just above him. Twice the diggers disturbed a dead German, buried evidently under the parapet. Once a significant crumbling of the earth and fall of a few heavy clods threatened a collapse where the gallery was under the edge of the trench. Well, the spot was hastily but securely shored up with an infinite caution, and the least possible sound, 
and after that the subaltern had the explosive charges brought along and connected up in readiness. Then, if the roof collapsed or their work were discovered, the switch at the shaft could still be pressed, the wires would still carry the current, and the mine would be exploded. At last the subaltern decided that everything was ready. He carefully placed his charges, connected up his wires again, cleared out his tools, and emerged to report, all ready. Now, the touching off of a good-sized mine is not a matter to be done lightly or without due and weighty authority, and that because more is meant to result from it than the upheaval of some square yards of earth and the destruction of so many yards of enemy trench. The mine itself, elaborate and labour-making as it may have been, is, after all, only a means to an end. That end may be the capture of a portion of the ruins of the trench, it may be the destruction of an especially strong and dangerous keep, a point of resistance or an angle for attack. It may even be a mine to destroy a mine which is known to be tunnelling into our own trenches. But in any case the explosion is usually a signal for attack from one side or the other, and therefore requires all the usual elaborate arrangements of reinforcements and supports and so on. Therefore the sapper subaltern, when he had finished his work and made his report, had nothing to do but sit down and wait until other people's preparations were made, and he received orders to complete his work by utterly and devastatingly destroying it. The subaltern found this wait about the most trying part of the whole affair, more especially since he had for a good many days and nights had so much to occupy his every moment. He received word at last of the day and hour appointed for the explosion, and had the honour of a visit of inspection from a very superior officer, who pored long and painstakingly over the paper plans, put a great many questions, even went the length of walking down the communication trench and peering down the entrance shaft, and looking over the sandbag wall through a periscope at the section of German trench marked down for destruction. Then he complimented the subaltern on his work, declined once again the offer of a muddy Mackintosh and an invitation to crawl down the mine, and went off. The subaltern saw him off the premises, returned to the shaft, and donned the Mackintosh and crawled off up his tunnel once more. Somehow, now that the whole thing was finished and ready, he felt a pang of reluctance to destroy it, and so fulfill its destiny. As he crawled along, he noted each little bit of shoring up and supporting planks, each rise and fall in the floor, each twist and angle in the direction, and recalled the infinite labour of certain sections, his glows of satisfaction at the speed of progress at the easy bits, his impatience at the slow and difficult portions. It seemed as if he had been building that tunnel for half a lifetime had hardly ever done anything else but build it or think about building it, and now, tomorrow, it was all to be destroyed. He recalled with a thrill of boyish pleasure the word of praise from the corporal, a far greater pleasure, by the way, than he had derived from the great one's compliments, the praise of one artist to another, the recognition of good work done by one who himself had helped in many good works, and knew well of what he spoke. She done, sir, the corporal had said. Oh, if I may say so, sir, she's a credit to you. A mighty tricky job, sir. And I've seen play with long years in the service that would have been stumped at times. I'm glad to have had a hand in it with you, sir. And uh, will the men feel the same way about it? Ah, well, the subaltern thought as he halted at the joint of the tea-piece, None of them felt the same about it as he himself did. He squatted there a moment, listening to the drip of water that was the only sound. Suddenly his heart leapt. Was it the only sound? What was that other, if it could be called a sound? It was a sense, rather, an indefinable blending of senses like hearing and feel and touch. A faint, barely perceptible thump, thump, like the beat of a man's heart in his breast. He snapped off the light of his electric lamp and crouched breathless in the darkness, straining his ears to hear. 
he was soon satisfied. He had not lived these days past, with the sound of digging in his ears by day and his dreams by night, not to recognize the blows of a pick. There! They had stopped now, and in imagination he pictured the digger laying down the pick to shovel out the loosened earth. Then, after a pause, the measured bump, bump, went on again. The subaltern crawled along first one arm of the cross-section and then the other, halting every now and then to place his ear to the wet planking or the wetter earth. He located at last the point nearest to the sound, and without more waste of time scurried off down his tunnel to the daylight. He was back in the mine again in less than half an hour, a bare thirty minutes, but each minute close-packed with concentrated essence of thought and action. The nearest trench telephone had put him in touch with battalion headquarters, and through them with brigade, divisional, and general headquarters. He had told his story and asked for his orders clearly, quickly, and concisely. The Germans were countermining. Their tunnel could not possibly miss ours, and by the sound would break through in thirty to sixty minutes. What were his orders? It took some little time for the orders to come, mainly because, although he knew nothing of it, his mind was part of a scheme for a general attack, and general attacks are affairs that cannot be postponed or expedited as easily as a cold lunch. But the subaltern filled in the time of waiting, and when the orders did come he was ready for them, or any other. They were clear and crisp. He was to fire the mine, but only at the latest possible minute. That was all he got, and indeed all he wanted, and since they did not concern him, there is no need here to tell of the swirl of other orders that buzzed and ticked and talked by field telegraph and telephone for miles up and down and behind the British line. Before these orders had begun to take shape or coherency as a whole, the subaltern was back listening to the thump, thump of the German picks, and busily contemplating his preparations. It was near noon and perhaps the workers would stop for a meal, which would give another hour for troops to be pushed up, or whatever else the generals wanted time for. It might even be that a fall of their roof, an extra inflow of water to their working, or any one of the scores of troubles that hamper and hinder underground mining might stop the crawling advance of the German sappers for a day or two, and allow the subaltern's mind to play its appointed part at the appointed time of the grand attack. But, meantime, the subaltern took no chances. First he connected up a short switch, which in the last extreme of haste would allow him, with one touch of his finger, to blow up the mine and himself with it. He buried or concealed the wires connecting the linked charges with the switch outside, so as to have a chance of escape himself. He opened a portable telephone he had carried with him and joined up to the wire he had also carried in, and so was in touch with his corporal and the world of the above ground. All these things he did himself, because there was no need to risk more than one man in case of a quick explosion. Then, his preparations complete, he sat down to wait and to listen to the thudding picks of the Germans. They were very near now, and with his ear to the wall the subaltern could hear the shovels now as well as the picks. He shut his lamp off after a last look at his switch, his revolver, and the glistening walls and mud ooze floor of his tunnel, and sat still in the darkness. Once he whispered an answer into the telephone to his corporal, and once he flicked his lamp on an instant to glance at the watch on his wrist. Then he crouched still and silent again. The thumping of his heart nearly drowned the thud of the picks. He was shivering with excitement and his mouth grew dry and leathery. He felt a desire to smoke, and had his case out and a cigarette in his lips when it occurred to him that when the Germans broke through, the smell of the smoke would tell them instantly that they were in an occupied working. He counted on a certain amount of delay and doubt on their part when their picks first pierced his wall, and he counted on that pause again to give him time to escape. So he put the cigarette away and immediately was overwhelmed with a craving for it. He fought it for five minutes, that felt like five hours, and felt his desire grow tenfold with each minute. 
It nearly drove him to doing what all the risk, all the discomfort of his cramped position, all the danger had not done. To creep out and fire the mine without waiting for that last instant, when the picks would break through. It could make little difference, he argued to himself, in the movements of those above. What could five minutes more, or ten, or even fifteen matter now? It might even be that he was endangering the success of the explosion by waiting, and it was perhaps wiser to crawl out at once and fire the mine, and he could safely light a cigarette then as soon as he was around the corner of the tea. So he argued the matter out, fingering his cigarette case and longing for the taste of the tobacco, and yet knowing in his innermost heart that he would not move, despite his arguments until the first pick came through. He heard the strokes draw nearer and nearer, and now he held his breath and strained his eyes as each one was delivered. The instant he had waited for came in exactly the fashion he had expected. A thud, a thread of yellow light piercing the black dark, a grunt of surprise from the pick-wielder at the lack of resistance to his stroke. All this was just what he had expected, had known would happen. The next stroke would show the digger that he was entering some hole. Then there would be cautious investigation, the sending back word to an officer, the slow and careful enlargement of the opening. And before that moment came, the subaltern would be down his tunnel and outside and pressing the switch. Uh, but his program worked out no further than that first instant and that first gleam of light. He saw the gleam widen suddenly as the pick was withdrawn, heard another quick blow, saw the round spot of light run out in little cracks and one wide rift, and suddenly the wall fell in, and he was staring straight into the German gallery with a dark figure silhouetted clear down to the waist against the light of an electric bulb lamp which hung from the gallery roof. For an instant the subaltern's blood froze. The figure of the German was only separated from him by a bare three yards, and to his dark blinded eyes it seemed that he himself was standing in plain view in a brilliant blaze of light. Actually, he was in almost complete darkness. The single light in the German gallery hardly penetrated through the gloom of his own tunnel, and what little did showed nothing to the eyes of the German, used to the lamplight and staring suddenly into the black rift before him. But the German called out to someone behind him, twisted round, moved, stooping, back to the lamp, and reached up a hand to it. The subaltern backed away hastily, his eyes fixed on the glow of light in the opening. The hole had broken through on a curve of his tunnel, so that for fifteen or twenty feet back he could still see the German gallery, could watch the man unhook the lamp and carry it back to the opening, thrust the lamp before him, and lean in over the crumbling heap of earth his pick had brought down. The subaltern stopped, and drew a gasping breath, and held it. Discovery was a matter of seconds now. He had left his firing switch, but he still carried the portable telephone slung from his shoulder, the earth pin dangling from it. He had only to thrust the pin into the mud, and he was connected up with the corporal at the outside switch. Had only to shout one word, fire, and it would all be over. Quickly but noiselessly he put his hand down to catch up the wire with the earth pin. His hand touched the revolver butt in his holster, checked at it, closed round it, and slid it softly out. All this had taken an instant of time, and as he raised his weapon he saw the German still staring hard under the upheld lamp into the gloom. He was looking the other way, and the subaltern leveled the heavy revolver and paused. The sights stood out clear and black against the figure standing in the glow of light, a perfect and unmissable target. The man was bareheaded, and wore a mud-stained blue shirt with sleeves cut off above the elbow. The subaltern moved the notched sights from under the armpit of the raised arm that held up the light, and steadied them on the round of the ear that stood out clear against the close-cropped black hair. He heard a guttural exclamation of wonder saw the head come slowly round till the circle of the ear foreshortened, and moved past his sights, and they were centred straight between the staring eyes. His finger contracted on the trigger, but a sudden qualm stayed him. It wasn't fair. It wasn't sporting. It was too like shooting a sitting hare. And the man hadn't seen him yet, even. Man? 
acquaintance with no man, a lad rather, a youth, a mere boy, with childish, wondering eyes, a smooth oval chin, the mouth of a pretty girl. The subaltern had a schoolboy brother hardly younger than this boy, and a quick vision rose of a German mother and sisters. No, he couldn't shoot. It would be murder. It and then a quick start, an upward movement of the lamp, a sharp question, told him the boy had seen. The subaltern spoke softly in fairly good German. Run away, my boy. In an instant my mind will explode. Who is it? Who is there? gasped the boy. The subaltern chuckled and grinned uh, wickedly. Swiftly he dropped the revolver, fumbled a moment, and pulled a coil of capped fuse from his pocket. It is the English, he said. It is an English mine that I now explode. And on that word lit the fuse and flung it, fizzing and spinning a jet of sparks and smoke toward the boy. The lad flinched back and half turned to run, but the subaltern saw him look round over his shoulder and twist back, saw the eyes glaring at the fiery thing in the mud, the dreadful resolve grow swiftly on the set young face, the teeth clamped on the resolve. He was going to dash for the fuse, to try to wrench it out, and, as he supposed, prevent the mine exploding. The subaltern jerked up the revolver again. This would never do. The precious seconds were flying. At any moment another man might come. He would have saved this youngster if he could, but he could allow nothing to risk the failure of his mind. Get back, he said sharply. Get back or I shall shoot. But now what he had feared happened. A voice called, a scuffling footfall sounded in the German gallery, a dim figure pushed forward into the light beside the boy. The subaltern saw that it was an officer, heard his angry oath in answer to the boy's quick words, his shout, The light, fool, break it! saw the clenched fists, vicious buffet in the boyish face, and the quick grab at the electric bulb. The subaltern's revolver sights slid off the boy and hung an instant on the snarling face of the officer. In the confined space the roar of his heavy revolver rolled and thundered in reverberating echoes. The swirling powder reek blinded him and stung in his nostrils, and as the smoke cleared he could see the boy scrambling back along his gallery, and the officer sprawled face down across the earth heap in the light of the fallen lamp. The subaltern smashed the lamp himself before he too turned and plunged, floundering and slipping and stumbling, for his exit in an agony of haste and apprehension. It was all right, he told himself a dozen times. The officer was done for. The back of that head, and a past knowledge of a service revolver's work at close range, told him that plain enough. It would take a good many minutes for the boy to tell his tale, and even then, if a party ventured back at once, it would take many more minutes in the dark, and he was glad he thought to smash the lamp before they could find his charges or the wires. It was safe enough, but the tunnel had never seemed so long or the going so slow. He banged against beams and supports, ploughed through sticky mud and churning water, rasped his knuckles and bruised knees and elbows in his mad haste. It was safe enough, but... But... But suppose there was no response to his pressure on the switch... Suppose there had been some silly mistake in making the connections. Suppose the battery wouldn't work. There were a score of things to go wrong. Thank goodness he had overhauled and examined everything himself. Although that again would only make it more appallingly awful if things didn't work. No time now, no chance to go back and put things right. Perhaps he ought to have stayed back there and made the contact. A quick end, if it worked right, and a last chance to refix it if it didn't. Yes, he... But there was the light ahead. He shouted, Fire! at the top of his voice, still hurrying on and half-cowering from the expected roar and shock of the explosion. Nothing happened. He shouted again, and again as loud as his sobbing breath and laboring lungs would let him. Still nothing and it began to sear his brain as a dreadful certainty that he had failed, that his mind was a ghastly frost, that all the labor gone to its making and the good lives spent on it were wasted. He stumbled weakly out into the shaft, caught a glimpse of the corporal's set face strong at the tunnel mouth, and tried once more to call out, Fire! But the corporal was waiting for no word. 
He had already got that, had heard the subaltern's first shouts roll down the tunnel, in fact was waiting with a finger on the exploding switch for the moment the subaltern should appear. The finger moved steadily over as the subaltern stumbled into sight, and the solid earth heaved convulsively, shuddered, and rocked and shook to the roaring blast of the explosion. The shock and the rush of air from the tunnel mouth caught the subaltern staggering to his knees and flung him headlong, and as he picked himself up again the air darkened with whizzing clods and mud and dust and stones and dirt that rained down from the sky. Before the echoes of the explosion had died away, before the last fragments and debris had fallen, there came the sound of another roar, the bellowing thunder of the British guns, throwing a storm of shell and shrapnel between the German supports and the ruined trench. That, and another sound, told the subaltern that the full fruits of his work were to be fully reaped. The sound of the guns, and the full, deep-chested, roaring cheers of the British infantry, as they swarmed from their trenches and rushed to occupy the crater of the explosion. Later in the day, when the infantry had made good their possession of the place, had sandbagged and fortified it to stand against the expected counter-attacks, the subaltern went to look over the ground and see at first, in close hand, the results of his explosion. Technically, he found it interesting. Humanly, it was merely sickening. The ground was one weltering chaos and confusion of tossed earth heaps and holes, of broken beams and jagged ended planks, of flung sandbags and wrecked barricading. Of trench or barricade, as trench and barricade, there remained simply no sign. The wreckage was scattered thick with a dreadful debris of dead bodies, of bloody clothing, of helmets and broken rifles, burst packs and haversacks, bayonets, water bottles, and shattered equipments. The ambulance men were busy, but there were still many dead and dying and wounded to be removed, wounded with torn flesh and mangled limbs, dead and dying with scorched and smoldering clothes. The infantry, hastily digging and filling sandbags and throwing up parapets on the far edge of the reeking explosion pit, had found many bodies caught in the descending avalanche of earth or buried in the collapsed trenches and dugouts, and here and there, amid the confusion, a foot or a hand protruding stark from some earth heap marked the death place of other victims. The whole scene was one of death, of desolation, of ruin and destruction, and the subaltern turned from it sick at stomach. It was the first result of a big explosion he had seen. This was the sort of thing that he had read so often summed up in a line of the official dispatch or a two-line newspaper paragraph. A mine was successfully exploded under a section of the enemy's trench. A mine. His mine. God, the subaltern said softly under his breath and looked wonderingly about him. He's a bloomin' little butcher, is it, Lieutenant of ours? The corporal said that night. Of course, it was a good bit of work, and he'd reason to be proud of it, but, well, I thought I had a strongish stomach, and I've seen some dirty blood and bones messes in my time. But that scorching shambles near turned me over. And he comes back after looking at it as cheerful as the corner man of a Christy minstrel troupe. And as pleased as a dog with two tails, fair pleased he was. But he was a little wrong. What had brought the subaltern back with such a cheerful air was not the sight of his work, not the grim picture of the smashed trenches. It was an encounter he had had with a little group of German prisoners, the recognizing amongst them of a dirty, mud-stained blue shirt with sleeves cut off above the elbows, a close-cropped bare head, a boy's face with a smooth oval chin and girlish eyes. The mine work he had directed, but others had shared it. It was the day's work, it was an incident of war, it was, after all, merely a mine successfully exploded. But that one life saved was also his work, and moreover his own, his individual personal work. 
It was of that he thought most as he came back smiling to his corporal. End of section three.